Are you ready to tackle the fundamental theorem of algebra? And uh, just like the title implies that we've got a very important night tonight. This isn't just any theorem of algebra, but it's the fundamental, the most important, the chief theorem of all of algebra. And so let's jump right into it here. We're going to say that every polynomial expression factors into the same number of linear factors as its what? Any guesses, any predictions? Same number of factors as its degree. Okay, so take a moment to uh, digest what this sentence is saying a little bit. We're, again, we're, just to repeat it, every polynomial expression factors into the same number of linear factors as its degree. What does this mean in English? Well, for example, if we have a fifth degree polynomial, you know, it's x to the fifth plus da 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 yada um, it's guaranteed to factor into five linear factors. Now, what, what's so special about linear? We're just saying it, it can't be quadratic, it can't be cubic, it's got to be each factor has to be linear or first degree, where the biggest exponent is a one. Okay, uh, therefore, it will have exactly... And that's a different word that we haven't used yet up until now. Exactly five zeros, a combination of real and complex. Now, why haven't we used the word exactly before? Well, in the past, we would have said there would be at most five zeros. Um, in fact, it, we would say at most five real zeros. Now we're saying there's exactly five zeros. They might all be real, or it might be a combination of um, you know three real and two complex, or some kind of combination of those. Well, on this particular slide, I want to review and study the relationship between zeros and factors. And if it feels like we've done this before, that's great. That means it's really, uh, we're starting to develop some familiarity with it. And uh, But I do have a few extra curveballs for you tonight. And uh, right off the bat, we're saying, well, here's the one you probably feel really good about. If x equals 3 is one of the zeros, then that means the quantity x minus 3 is one of the factors, okay? Now, how about this? The complex number 3 plus 2i is a 0. Then who's the factor? Okay, and I'm going to write it two ways. First of all, what I want you to think of is x minus the complex number 3 plus 2i. So you've got like that nested set of parentheses. Now, if you want to distribute the negative, that's great. We would just say x uh, minus 3 minus 2i is the factor of f of x. So you can write it, feel free to write it either way there. Um, if you do want to write it the second way, just start off by visualizing it or writing it with the uh, two sets of parentheses and then distribute the negative to get it this way. Okay, if I said f of 5 equals 0, then really what I'm saying is x equals 5 is one of my zeros, therefore the quantity x minus 5 is a factor of f of x. Now here's the trickier one. Um, if f of the quantity negative 4 plus i, or the complex number negative 4 plus i equals 0, then what we're really saying is x minus the complex number negative 4 plus i is a factor, or in other words, x plus 4 minus i is a factor. Okay, now we'll look at just the opposite. If we knew the quantity x plus 6 was a factor, then you know that x equals negative 6 is, is a 0. And then here's the real goofy one. I think this is maybe the most challenging thing tonight. So if you knew that x plus 2 minus 6i was a factor, really what I want to do is I want you to see that as x minus something. Okay, and what that is is negative 2... Uh, plus 6i, okay? Now, do you agree with me that if I distribute this negative sign, you know, negative times a negative would give me that positive right there, and negative times positive would give me this negative? Um, so try to rewrite the given factor with the double set of parentheses, and what that, that's going to help you now say that x equals um, negative 2 plus 6i is a 0, Okay? Next, I want to practice factoring completely, and what you're going to do as we go through this list of problems I have prepared is you're going to see some that you were able to factor back in Algebra 1, and then you're going to see some other ones that look very, very similar, but we weren't really able to factor them until just recently. Um, so, for instance, this first one is what we call a difference of two perfect squares with that minus sign in there, and this is an example of one that you were able to factor back in Algebra 1. It's going to be x plus 3 times the quantity 
uh, x minus 3. Notice that these, um, these two factors, these two linear factors, are conjugate pairs. And that's going to be true for every difference or sum of two perfect squares. The other thing I want you to notice is this was a second degree uh, polynomial. And because it's a second degree, there's exactly two factors. And that's what the fundamental theorem of algebra is saying is that if this is second degree, we know there's going to be two factors. If this was a third degree, then there'd be a third factor right out here. Okay, the next one, and what makes this one different, is now it's the sum of two perfect squares. I'm going to still have conjugate pairs. Let's see, I'm going to use this one. Um, but in this case, it's going to be x plus 3i and x minus 3i. And those would be my factors. If you have any um, hesitation about that, what you can do is you could set this equal to 0 and try to solve it by subtracting the 9 over. And then if you took the square root of both sides, you'd confirm that you're getting plus or minus 3i as the, the zeros or the solutions. Hence, the roots or the factors are going to be x plus 3i and x minus 3i. Okay, next one here. Uh, we do have our minus sign, so we're going back to algebra 1, x plus 6, x minus 6. But once we put that plus sign in there, now it's more of an algebra 2 topic. And, um, and we know now that it's going to be x plus 6i and x minus 6i. So hopefully you feel good about the pattern. If it's a minus 36, then we're using real numbers. Uh, but if it's plus 36, then we're using imaginary numbers or complex numbers. Okay, let's try that again. Um, here we go. We've got the difference of two perfect squares. So I'm thinking 3x plus 7 and 3x minus 7. So we're using real numbers. Once they throw that plus sign in there, now I'm going to use imaginary numbers. And I'm thinking 3x plus 7i and 3x minus 7i. But really, don't get lost. The theme here tonight is that it's a second degree polynomial. Therefore, we have one, two linear factors. Let's take a look at a couple more. Okay, first of all, look for your GCF is my advice here. Um, easy trick to overlook. Both of these terms do have an x in common. So that would turn into x squared plus 25. And as I continue to bring that x down, I now have the sum of two perfect squares. So I'm going to use imaginary numbers because it was the sum. x plus 5i and x minus 5i. And here's the trick. You see how we had a third degree polynomial? We've got one, two, three linear factors. All right, the next one. Uh, question number eight here. My GCF now is x squared, which leaves me with x plus 25. And on the surface, you think that this might violate the first fundamental theorem because what you're seeing is third degree, but you're only seeing um, two factors. But the trick is this one right here is not linear yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a step further, and I'm going to say x squared is really x times x times the quantity x plus 25. And now we do indeed have one, two, three linear factors. Uh, question number nine is is the most intimidating looking one of the whole group. Now what you notice to me is, and this is worth putting a star, is that this is there's four terms in this polynomial, which implies that we're going to use the technique called grouping. Hopefully, hopefully grouping works. We've also seen some problems where grouping doesn't work on some four terms, but we'll try it. Uh, so my first GCF here is going to be x squared, leaving me with x plus two. Um, my second GCF is going to be a positive 64, leaving me with an x plus 2 as well. Now what we've got is, what does this group here and what does this group here have in common? Well, they both have the quantity x plus 2, so we'll factor that out. It leaves me with x squared plus 64. Uh, in the old days, we would have stopped right here and said, well, because this isn't the difference of two perfect squares, we can't go any further. And that was true back in September and October, but now it's different now that we know um, what imaginary numbers are. So I could say x plus 2, and I'm going to go x plus 8i and x minus 8i. And just like the fundamental theorem of algebra says, is if this is third degree, we've got one, two, three linear factors. Uh, this next example is a mouthful, and it's definitely worth copying down all the directions with good details, um, and I think that'll pay off down the road for sure. But they said we're giving you a cubic function, and notice because it's x to the third, we call it a cubic function. One of the zeros was given, so they were saying f of negative 2 is equal to 0, aka negative 2 is one of my zeros. 
And the basically the remainder theorem is what tells me that the quantity x plus 2 is one of the factors by virtue of the remainder being 0. Okay, so what I'm going to do in order to find um, the other two solutions, because we know that there's going to be a grand total of three solutions, right? And they gave me one of them, so there's two out there that still need to be found. Uh, what I'm going to do to find the other two is I'm going to do my long division here. So I'm going to set it up like this, x plus 2 as the divisor, and my dividend is going to be x cubed plus 2x squared plus 5x plus 10. And we know that the remainder should be zero. We just need to work through our long division, okay? So go ahead and try it yourself. We'll see if we get the same thing. Okay, so check this out. See if you agree with my long division. The, the interesting thing was um, when I subtracted this first uh, group right here, I got zero x squared. And uh, so then I brought down my 5x and I said 5x divided by x was equal to 5. And that's how I got my, my quotient up here with the final remainder of 0, which was great news. If you got anything other than 0 down here, that would be a red flag and, and things wouldn't be good. So what do we know so far? What have we found? Well, here's what we know. f of x is equal to the first factor of x plus 2. And the second factor is the quotient x squared plus 5. But today they're saying, don't stop there. We need to express f of x as the product of three linear factors, not the product of one linear and one quadratic. So we're going to push forward here and see if we can't go a little bit further and say, well, f of x is really the product of x plus 2. And what other linear factors? And this one's very, very challenging. The first thing that you notice here is that you've got the sum of, of two numbers. So that, that as soon as you see the plus sign, you know you're going to be using imaginary numbers. Now, what's troublesome is that 5 is not a perfect square, but we can still handle it. Watch this. x plus radical 5i and x minus radical 5i. Check that out. Uh, because normally what would happen is, let's say, you had, um, let's say you had a 16 here. What would you do with the 16? Well, you'd put a 4 here and a 4 here, right? Or let's say you had a 36 right here. You'd put a 6 here and a 6 here. So all you're doing is taking the square root of this number every time you do the sum of two perfect squares. Um, the other way that you could confirm that is you could take x squared plus 5, um, set it equal to 0, subtract the 5 over, and then take the square root of both sides, and you get x equals plus or minus radical 5i. Of course, the i is because of that negative underneath the radical. And then you would rewrite these zeros in factored form. So uh, the moral of the story is we've expressed f of x as the product of 1, 2, 3 linear factors today, and that was our goal. Well, this is our last problem of the night, and what's been given to us is they told us, uh, or they gave me this polynomial function, p of x, equals x cubed plus 3x squared plus x minus 5, and they gave me a graph of it. And, um, and there's a lot of uh, little questions associated with it. I think it goes all the way from uh, A through G, so we'll tackle them one at a time, and some are going to be easier than others. But they said, if you just look at the graph, um, how do we know there's only one real solution? And I want you to focus on the word real right here. And that corresponds to this point right here. So there's only one real solution because P of X only crosses the X axis once. Okay, in other words, what we're saying is every time you cross the X axis, that's you generate another real solution as opposed to a complex solution. So real means we're crossing the X axis. In this case, you only crossed it once. So there's only one real solution. Uh, part B, is it possible for a cubic? Um, and every time I say cubic, I want you to think X cubed to yourself to have no um, zeros. Well, there's a couple of th ways we could answer this. So first of all, the answer is it, no, it's not possible. Um, the uh, fundamental theorem of algebra, which tonight's lesson is all about, says a cubic is going to have three zeros, okay? Um, a combination of real and complex. Now, the other thing we could say is, well, you remember when we talked about odd degree and end behavior? But you know that it's either going to start low and finish high, or it's going to start high and finish low, and by virtue of that, it's got to cross the x-axis at least once and up to three times, okay? So just based on end behavior rules, we could say it's got to cross at least once. 
All right, next question. From the graph, what appears to be one solution of p of x? So we could easily say that x equals 1 uh, because of this point right here appears to be one solution. How could we verify that solution? Well, the remainder theorem says that p of 1 should equal 0. So let's go ahead and test that out. And I'm going to take a peek at, okay, so x cubed plus 3x squared. So let's say um, we'll substitute the 1, and that's going to be 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 squared plus 1 minus 5. And let's see if we can work that out. So that's going to be 1 plus 3 plus 1 minus 5. And I believe if you add up all those numbers, you do indeed get zero. So check, uh, because we got zero and nothing else, um, we verified that x equals 1 is a solution. Okay, now according to the remainder theorem, what's one factor of p of x? And we could say, well, x minus 1's got to be the factor if x equals 1 is the zero. So everything's cruising along right here until we get to this point right here. This is the big bear. Now they want me to find the other two zeros. And here's where we're going to do our long division. So just think of that last problem where they had given us one of the zeros ahead of time and then it was our job to find the other ones. So we're going to go ahead and same thing as, as before. I'm going to let you guys rip through your long division here um, to practice and make sure we got it. And then we'll come back and compare. Okay, so take a peek at what I got cooking here. Um, I, do, I worked through all my long division. Good news was I got a remainder of zero. and My quotient was x squared plus uh, 4x plus a 5, which looks great. So I like this little statement that I wrote right here, and, and I'd like you to incorporate in your notebook. We say, therefore, we know that p of x at this point is the product of a linear factor, x minus 1, times a, a quadratic factor, x squared plus 4x plus 5. But we still haven't answered the question. They wanted me to find the other two zeros. So I've got to keep factoring this bear. Bad news, though, real bad news. I don't think this quadratic right here factors. And if it doesn't factor, what's our next best plan? Yeah, you said it. We've got to do the quadratic formula. So what I'm going to do right up here off to the side is I'm going to work through the quadratic formula. Same thing with you. I'd like you to try that yourself. And this would be great practice because we haven't done the quadratic formula in a little while. So, so just I'll review it really quick and see if we get the same thing simplified the same way. Now you'll notice um, as I work through, um, I did get a negative 4 underneath my radical, which generated, as expected, the imaginary component here of my complex number. Now as far as simplifying this radical right here, I took advantage of what we call the distributive property of division, and where I divided negative 4 by 2 and I also divided 2i by 2, and I ended up with negative 2 plus or minus i as my simplified answer. So as far as the other two zeros they were asking for, we'd say negative 2 plus i, and then negative 2 minus i are the other two. The last thing they want me to do, and this isn't as easy as it sounds, is they want me to express p of x as the product of three linear factors. Well, you know what? It's not too bad, and hopefully you'll agree here. So we know that p of x is equal to x minus 1. That was the easy one. Now I'm going to say x minus the, the first root, negative 2 plus i. And then I'm going to say x um, minus the other one, which is negative 2 minus i. Okay. Now what I could do is I could distribute that negative to kind of clean these up a little bit and say x plus 2 minus i is one of the factors and x plus 2 plus i is the third factor. So we've got uno, dos, tres, three factors according to the fundamental theorem of algebra. So uh, great job hanging tough today you guys and I think uh, you're going to do really really well on the sheet tomorrow. If not, we got little questions, we'll be there to back you up. Catch you tomorrow.